this is a special edition of Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the premier financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Now, for this special edition of Macro Voices, here's hedge fund manager Eric Townsend. Macro Voices Energy Week, episode number two, was recorded on Wednesday, May 15th, 2019. I'm Eric Townsend. For our second episode, I'll be joined by Hedgeye Senior Energy Policy Analyst Joe McMonagle, former market regulator Chris Cook, and professional crude oil trader Tracy Shukart, better known as Shy Girl on Twitter. Now let's dive right into the EIA weekly inventory data. Crude oil building 5.4 million barrels this week. Obviously, that's a big inventory build, but it's not as big as the 8.6 million barrels that API, the American Petroleum Institute, had forecast on Tuesday evening. That breathed a little bit of relief, I think, into the market. Cushing, Oklahoma, building 1.8 million barrels. Gasoline drawing down 1.1 million barrels. Distillates building 84,000 barrels. Needless to say, with gasoline being the only drawdown across the board, there was massive up action as Arbob Gasoline broke through its 8, 5, 34, and 13-day moving averages and stalled out as it reached its 21-day moving average, just over 2 spot 02 on Arbob Gasoline. WTI crude oil also up on the news despite the very large build on crude inventory, moving above most of its moving averages and topping out just below its 13-day moving average, which is at 62 spot 22 as we speak on Wednesday afternoon. U.S. production was down 100,000 barrels to 12.1 million barrels, still a really big number, but that's the second downtick in a row, two weeks in a row that we've been down 100,000 barrels from 12.3 million barrels, the all-time record set just a few weeks ago. Now, those 200,000 fewer barrels of oil produced in the United States is not a really big number, but it could be a really important trend to watch because until now, we've seen steady growth in that U.S. production number as shale production continues to grow. And that has continued to grow even in the face of declining rig counts. Are those rig count declines finally catching up with the market? Are we seeing the beginning of a downtrend in U.S. production? Time will tell. We've only got a couple of downticks to report so far, but it certainly is worthy of further attention. Imports came in at 7.6 million barrels per day. Exports, 3.3 million barrels per day. Massive number. That's 23 million barrels of U.S. crude oil exported on the week last week. As of Wednesday afternoon's close, WTI closed at 62 spot 02. Brent closed at 71 spot 77. And again, WTI crude is just below its 13-day moving average, while our Bob Gasoline broke out above all of its short-term moving averages and is just flirting with its 21-day average right around 2 spot 02. Now let's meet this week's expert panel. Joe McMonagall is former chief of staff at the U.S. Department of Energy and former vice chairman of the International Energy Agency. Joe regularly attends OPEC meetings and is a frequent commentator on oil markets for many major media outlets. Joe, as an OPEC watcher who attends the OPEC meetings and talks behind the scenes with various ministry officials, I'm wondering what you think will be the big takeaways from this weekend's meeting of the OPEC Joint Ministerial Monitoring Committee in Saudi Arabia. Well, let me start with the bottom line, Eric, uh, and it's great to be with you uh, on my first participation on the, the new energy podcast. I think the bottom line is about a month ago, I thought we'd see some good signals out of this JEDA meeting in terms of what to expect a month later at the full OPEC meeting in June in Vienna. But now I, I don't think we will get any clarity from this weekend about OPEC June decisions in terms of extending the cuts or increasing supplies, at least under current allowable levels under the agreement. And that's mainly due to the no Iran waivers still shaking out and also the recent Game of Drones attacks over the last few days in Saudi Arabia. So I suspect we will probably get a repeat of the March JMMC meeting where the Saudis emphasized 
keeping markets stable while still tiptoeing around extending the cuts through the end of the year. The Saudis want to extend the cuts, but others, most importantly, the Russians, do not. So going back to your question, I think the three big takeaways will be, number one, increased compliance with the cuts compared to March when especially the Russians were barely complying. And a lot of that is due to the the Saudi UAE producing at below their quota levels. I mean, the Saudis are producing about 500,000 barrels below where they could be producing under the under the OPEC agreement. And of course, more drastic declines in, in Venezuela, sort of an involuntary uh, compliance. And then two, I think, as we saw in comments from uh, the Russian energy minister, Alexander Novak, today on the various wire services, Russia is still undecided on extending the cuts through the second half of 2019. As, as everyone knows, the cuts only go through the end of June. I think if it were up to Novak and Russian oil companies, they wouldn't extend. But Putin likes the limelight Russia receives with OPEC cooperation. That said, I think the Russians are increasingly concerned about surging U.S. production and the role that OPEC cuts and higher prices play in in providing incentives. And then finally, I think the Saudis will be walking a tightrope in terms of messaging with talk about providing supplies if the market needs it. But we think they're planning to stick to their new Saudi destocking strategy to further drain global inventories and keep markets tight, with a special emphasis on reduced exports to the U.S. in order to impact the EIA weekly data, which, which the market follows religiously. Remarkably, there's been no change in Saudi action since the Iran waivers were not renewed, which I think just shows how committed the Saudis are to this de-socking strategy. So I'll leave it there and uh, and look forward to talking more in the next segment. Well, Joe, thanks for that update. I definitely want to come back to the game of drones and the Saudi tanker attacks, but let's meet the rest of the panel first. Our next panelist is professional crude oil trader Tracy Shukart, call sign Shy Girl on Twitter. Tracy, we are at a critical time of the month. Options on West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil Futures expire tomorrow, May 16th. And then a few days later, the June delivery contract will reach its last trading day and traders will roll forward to the July contract. Tracy, please give us the lowdown on why this particular OPEX and contract role has so many traders' attention. Right. So, well, thank you for having me on. And I'm excited to be part of this new series with you. That said, we'll move into the role. So uh, options on, again, as you said, U.S. crude oil futures expire tomorrow. Futures contracts themselves reach their last trading day on Tuesday the 24th. So that means that all traders who are not taking physical delivery, which is the majority of the market, must close their positions no later than Tuesday. Big funds have to be done rolling their positions by OPEX. So that'll be done tomorrow. In practice, most traders begin rolling their positions forward to the next monthly contract several days to two weeks in advance of the trading day. This contract roll, however, is of particular interest in the fact that we had, as of four days ago, over a half a billion barrels worth of protective put options still outstanding. And to kind of put this into perspective, that was 35% of all the open interest on NYMEX for 2019. That means that the market can easily see big moves in the price of oil futures as those large option positions are either rolled forward or closed out completely in the next 24 hours. Now we've already been seeing that, you know, over the last few days, we've had these big two and $3 moves in one day. Um, So the operative rule here is when options OI is, which is open interest, is really high going into OPEX. That means that we should see considerable volatility on and around OPEX day in the underlying crude futures oil contract. And now if we, Go back and we talk about a little bit more about this half a billion barrels worth of protected puts. Uh, About a quarter of this increase was from six strike prices. There were 60, 61, 63, 61, 50, 62, 50, and 62. So this clustering kind of reveals the spot prices in the low 60s that are a sweet spot for U.S. 
producers to lock in their near term price risk. And this is exactly where our trading range has been for a couple of weeks heading into roll. So generally, when you're heading into OPEX, again, a good gauge of the trading range can be looking at options OI strikes and where they lie. You can get this information at Quick Strike Options Pricing and Analysis Tools via CME Group through their website. You can bet pro traders will be watching these strikes since often the market trades between these high volume OI areas where open interest lies. And our final panelist is Chris Cook, a former market regulator with decades of experience in both the paper and physical markets. Chris, I know that you're a big fan of analyzing the shape of the forward curve or term structure in order to help form your view of where the market is headed. The Brent curve has moved into steep backwardation, while the WTI curve still has just a tiny bit of contango in that very first spread. So what are the forward curves telling you about where this market may be headed? Thanks very much um, to be here among such a, a stellar cast of traders. Um, really looking forward to this. I have been interested in market term structure for a long, long time. But looking at it from the perspective of the evolution of the markets and the participation, if you go way back, we saw Wall Street refiners come in. We then saw in the mid-90s, we saw the innovation of um, the first funds that came in. You know, the index funds began. And and then in 2001, things the entry of the Intercontinental Exchange, where in my view the you know the Wall Street banks and the big oil companies essentially asserted control of the of the market. Since then, I think we've seen the growth of a new type of investor. Classically, we've been looking at the curve from the point of view of physical participants and speculators, and so you've got people offloading risk and people taking on risk called speculators. But the most interesting thing to me has been the coming into the market of what, I think it was Mike Masters at the 2008 uh, hearings at CFTC, you know, when the, the price went to $140 and whatnot. He came up with this expression of passive investors because he believed that the participation of index funds and ETFs and then ETPs basically were affected price formation in the market. And I think he's absolutely right. I think that when such funds become dominant in the market, they literally kill the market price formation. And that's not just in oil. I think that's across the board. And the reason they do that is that essentially they're not obeying the same rules. They're not looking to take on risk. They are looking to offload risk, these guys. So that on the one side of the trade, you would have the BPs of this world are offloading the risk of oil and taking on dollar risk. But these inflation hedges, as they called them, or came to call themselves, they had the other side of that trade. And things got very interesting. We saw some really interesting buildup. I identified a phenomenon. I called it the big long. Because we saw on the CFTC managed money positions, you know, we, and we still constantly hear this refrain of, you know, hedge funds, hedge funds, hedge funds, hedge funds. And I'm thinking to myself, this isn't hedge funds. Hedge funds are active in the spot, you know, in the spot month two, month three, maybe. They're not active down the curve. And there are massive, you know, massive amounts of uh, open interest that are coming down the curve. Hedge funds are not long only, in my experience, either. But this big long, as I called it, was. And I believe we've seen these positions, the participation of a new species, really in the market, who were not actually playing by the same rules as the classic producers and consumer refiners and speculators. And for me, the, the episode that really, and I'll conclude with this, the episode that really convinced me there's something odd going on here, was in 2009 when we had the Super Contango. So on the one hand, we have a Super Contango, which is evidence of a, of a surplus of oil. But on the other, we saw the oil price rising dramatically for about six months. I'm sorry, that just didn't stack up. That, did, that was not, in my view, in line with classic market expectations as to the shape of the curve. And I have much more to say about what's happened since then, but I do believe that what we're seeing is not physically driven. It is, in my view, financially driven. And coming up next, we'll dive into our first discussion topic right after this. <laughs> 
For our first major discussion topic this week, we're going to take on the rapidly changing geopolitical risks to the market. From Saudi tanker attacks to Iran sanctions to the situation in Venezuela to U.S.-China trade talks, there's no shortage of topics to discuss. Joe McMonigle, let's start with your take on these developments. Yeah, so, I mean, the administration's moves on Iran, I think, are probably the foremost topic, probably. And and in my view, the maximum pressure on Iran means maximum pressure for oil markets. And the number of geopolitical risks are only rising as we head into the high demand summer season. So first on Iran sanctions, you know, the no waiver extensions decision by the U.S. has happened. The market really hasn't reacted that much, but I think that's because it's still trying to understand what this means in terms of supply cuts. And, you know, we think the big $80 oil barrel question is, what does China do? Also, potentially India. We think China will have a nuanced response, and they will decrease imports from Iran from current levels, but they won't be going to zero. Probably Iran exports, I think, fall to about three to 400,000 barrels a day, but not zero. But that's still a cut of about 700,000 barrels a day. And I'm not sure how much of that was priced into the market because I think the market was expecting waivers. Also, as you mentioned, we have the Iran reported attacks on Saudi tankers and pumping stations, the game of drones, as I as I said earlier. I think the jury is still out here, especially since the Saudis have not officially blamed Iran yet. But if you're Saudi Arabia or any country for that matter, and your arch enemy or their proxies just made two attempted attacks on major critical infrastructure, don't you have to respond some way? (laughs) Maybe that's why they haven't officially uh, blamed Iran yet. But I think this is a significant development, and obviously both events have been timed together. Then you have the State Department announcement about removing non-essential personnel from Iraq. And, and of course, Exxon and Chevron, I think, also indicated the same as U.S. intelligence reports are saying that Iran or, again, their proxies are looking at attacking U.S. interests or citizens in Iraq and potentially Lebanon. You know, if there is an attack, what does Europe do now in terms of the Iran nuclear deal and sanctions on Iran? And then again, if you're in Iran's shoes, the U.S. reimposed sanctions last year, and now they didn't re- renew the waivers, which means exports are heading closer to zero from about a million barrels a day. The White House no waiver statement said explicitly that the Saudis and UAE would pick up the slack and essentially replace Iran's customers. So it wouldn't be surprising if Iran was behind the Saudi attacks. I also think Iran thinks higher oil prices will hurt Trump. So attacking critical oil infrastructure in Saudi Arabia is not so far-fetched, in my view. And of course, any U.S.-Saudi-Israeli attack on Iran would be really help or point to rising risk and spike prices. And Tracy Shukart, what has your attention in geopolitics this week? So um, I've been looking at, obviously, the same things that Joe has. But also, I think we should go over Venezuela's situation, where we have a production and a decline that could fall as low as 500,000 barrels per day, which is off of, you know, we've been slowly declining. Um, and, you know, I think they were just at 1.1 million. And now, you know, we're looking at a rapid decrease in, in just a couple of months as the situation's gotten worse there. We also need to look at, we still have risk in Libya, where we have clashes between Haftar's Libyan National Army and the government of National Accord. And then you have the NOC that's caught right in the middle as one of the prizes. And he who controls the spice controls life, as Frank Herbert eloquently put it. Um, So we still have problems there. Another problem that we're also dealing with is the Urals contamination problem where, you know, they thought that this was going to be an easy fix. We were going to be able to clean these pipelines, that they were going to get clean oil through very quickly. Um, This problem is now progressing to an even bigger problem where cleaning the pipelines is going to be more difficult. And then what to do with the contaminated oil? You have to mix it with clean oil to bring down the organic chloride content. So there's no shortage of things that are going on in the market, geopolitically speaking, right now. And Chris Cook, what's your take on the geopolitics? 
Well, I think the supply side has been covered very well, and so I'm not really going to go too much into that, uh, apart from to say I've been to Iran 11 times, most recently in February, so I do know a little bit about it. But I, I just know enough to know that it's like, you know, uh, herding Persian cats. I'm much more interested in the buy side. I, I actually think that we're going through a potentially a dramatic, I mean, momentous change in, in market power here. I think the sell side, the producers have had the upper hand for the last 20, 30, maybe, maybe for longer than that, certainly 20, 30 years. And I think everybody's used to saying, well, you know, the, the sell side are always going to be in command. But I think OPEC is functionally dead. Uh, I think it's a zombie. Zangani was saying that, from, but then he would, wouldn't he? But I, I think China, you see, they are now the buyer of, you know, the biggest buyer globally. They have built immense storage capacity. They have their own benchmark, which has been quietly bubbling under. They've been making all the moves, as I see it, to potentially be in position. Also, another thing I should say is that they've been locking in long-term contracts. Most recently, we're seeing that Saudi has basically ceased sending oil to the US, which is an interesting evolution. And I think that's pretty much a permanent one. Certainly, with um, with Brent, you know, $8 over WTI, it makes very little sense to send it to the US, does it? Anyways, an aside there. So I, I think that the Chinese, as buyer of last resort, sanction proof, essentially, if they want to be, they don't really care what the Americans say. We're seeing a difference between the state arms and the teapots, the independents. They, you know, the independents are, are basically geared up to, um, to export products. And I could see China, because they're able to gouge distressed sellers like Iran, and, and I think they're just letting Iran swing in the wind at the moment, They'll come back and they'll lowball Iran. I know for a fact they are doing. And I think they're going to be in a position to basically dump cheap gasoline. And if they do start doing that on a big scale, the market's going to look very interesting. You know, I'm really chucking a big idea into the pot here. But we've seen a similar thing happen in refined sugar maybe 30 years ago. The metal industry for a long time was a buy side market. I believe that it's entirely possible that markets can swing. The tin, tin crisis, 1985, classic case. The market collapsed from $8,000 a ton to $4,000 a ton overnight because basically the market had been you know, artificially held up for a long time. And I've talked quite long enough, but you know, I'm coming at it from a different perspective on the demand side. I think the Chinese are gearing up for maybe a buy side equivalent of OPEC. Eric, if I could just make a comment on both of those I love I love the comments about China, but just in in another context, this whole idea of China coming back on tariffs on on LNG, and even though oil is not on the the current list, you know the threats that it will be. I think the point just made, you know, is that China has this voracious energy appetite, and in reality, this is really gamesmanship. And I think that they're going to take all the LNG. I don't think I don't think it's going to impact any U.S. LNG exports. Certainly not going to impact U.S. oil exports. But I agree. I do think they certainly have some buying power in negotiations with sellers. On Venezuela, I, I think Tracy raises a really important development here. And you know, certainly as, as we we've seen, their production is 500,000 barrels a day, mainly because of the power outages. But it's also because of incompetence and, and it's declining every day. But the media narrative here that we've seen in the last you know week or two is that Trump's focus is on Iran. But that's really been driven by the calendar and the waivers expiring and different moves that Iran has said since the waivers were not renewed. But I believe Venezuela is still Trump's number one foreign policy objective in removing Maduro. And for example, Pompeo's trip on Tuesday to Moscow, I was told that the number one agenda item for the U.S. was Venezuela and to try to get Russia to influence Maduro's exit. The other issue of the military option, you know, a lot of times that's just sort of talk. But it's in this case, it's not. It's real. And it was prompted by day one by Trump himself along the lines of Bush 41 and Panama, which he raised as an example with his advisors several times over the past two years. Now, he's been talked back from that from previous national security team members, McMaster and Mattis and John Kelly, but they're all gone now. And the new team is made up of of these uh, Venezuela hawks, that we, as we've seen in terms of Bolton and Pompeo, 
And also Pence is playing a very leading role inside the administration, pushing for for stronger actions. So I think the reasons for taking tougher action in Venezuela and for it to being the number one foreign policy uh, objective for the administration, which of course I think has big energy and oil implications are, number one, it's a quick military win, at least in Trump's mind. Two, it takes on a socialist dictator, which is kind of a political line they're pursuing for the 2020 campaign. Three, a new regime means potentially more global oil supply and lower prices. So a sort of buy the bombs theory. And three is Florida. And as we saw, there was a Washington Post article yesterday that quoted a former Republican state chairman that said, if Maduro is toppled, Trump's name is gold in South Florida. But he also warned the dangers of doing nothing and the view that Trump broke a promise or overpromised going into a re-election year. So I think we're going to wake up one day and see that Venezuela is actually the more important story, not only to Trump, but I think also to oil markets. I know Joe touched on a little bit about India. Um, I just think that's a little bit important. Um, you know, India also is a big buyer of Iranian oil. Now they've stopped buying since there were no waivers issued, but really they're waiting for their election to be over to make a decision. So I think the market is waiting on that a bit to see exactly what they are going to do, because we already know they have a payment mechanism in place to buy oil via rupees, if need be. They did ask the United States if the the United States could guarantee India oil at a certain price. The United States first said yes, and then they uh, came back and said no. So I think that's another big factor uh, markets waiting on is, you know, is India going to start buying from Iran again? You know, and how much they will be buying from Iran and meaning how many more barrels are going to be on the market from Iran? I also thought that it was interesting. I wanted to address something that Chris said. He was talking about gasoline. I think that it's very interesting that we see all of these um, large producers, Saudi Arabia, India, everybody's gotten into the refining business lately. So I think that, you know, any excess oil right now is in line to be refined as soon as a lot of these big refinery projects are finished and completed. So, you know, I could see at some point in the future where we kind of turn, you know, a product glut into more of a refining glut. Um, but, you know, that would be further down the line. I'll come, jump in on two points there. I'm really interested in what uh, you know, Joe was saying about Venezuela. My, my take is, and I'm always looking at the financial aspects, that both Rosneft and the Chinese are into Venezuela for big bucks, you know, really serious money. And for me, one of the sticking points they'll be looking to is some sort of guarantee, if that's possible, that if there is a change of regime, that those debts are going to be honoured. And I think that is a big issue, frankly. Uh, It'll be under the radar screen, but I'm sure that's why, you know, the Rosneft jets are flying over there from time to time. So that's one thing. Uh, On the sanctions side, I believe that counterintuitively, they can be bearish for markets unless you, the first time round with the sanctions for Iran, everybody was on board. So that was it. They were pretty much shut down, but they were still moving quite a bit of crude to some people the same. But now I think the Chinese are basically using this as leverage. I think the Indians are going to follow the Chinese once we see what the Chinese get away with. Because basically what happens is to the extent that sanctions are not absolute, they undermine the market bid. You know, it's all very well that, you know, the Saudis and whoever saying, yeah, we're going to supply the market. But at what price? I mean, they're coining it at the minute. You know, thank you very much to the extent that they're actually you know, being able to sell it. But I don't believe that they will supply the market at the price that the Iranians are prepared to do. Still less take rupees or RM, you know, CNY or whatever it is on the other side of it. So I'm afraid I actually see these sanctions as, as potentially eating away at the foundations of the market, depending on what happens in the next, you know, three to six months. Listeners, we'll be back with our second topic right after this. I want to thank Tracy for putting a poll out on Twitter to ask our listeners what topics you, our listeners, are most interested in. And the survey results were rather clear. So let's get straight to the price of oil. 
The market sold off dramatically from October through December, bottomed out on Christmas, and has since retraced just about 70% of that move down. But the rally stalled in the last week of April, and prices have been consolidating in the low 60s on WTI for the last several weeks. So where do we go from here when this consolidation pattern breaks, higher or lower? Let's weigh in with both the bullish and bearish arguments from each of our guests. Joe McMonigle, what do you see as the principal bull and bear arguments, and what's your own leaning with respect to price direction after weighing those arguments? Yeah, so I think we've talked a lot about, I think, some bullish cases to be made, certainly on these geopolitical topics with Iran and Venezuela. We didn't mention Libya, but that's there. You have the Russia pipeline contamination issue. But we also have, you know, we're going to summer driving season. We're in a a seasonal refinery maintenance, which I think is going to be much greater than it's been before, much greater and longer than it's been before. And they will not go into maintenance in, in the fall so that they can ramp up full tilt to meet IMO low sulfur demand at the end of the year and early next year. And of course, IMO itself is a, is a potentially bullish catalyst as well. And, uh, and also the Saudi destocking strategy, which I think is a real thing. And we're going to see that play out over the next uh, two or three months this summer. And of course, if we were to get some U- U.S.-China trade deal, I think, as we saw when it looked like the deal was on thin or breaking ice over the weekend and earlier this week, all of us, you know, I, I think we'll see the opposite if a deal is consummated. But I think it's important to to look at what the bearish possibilities would be. And I think, you know, on the top of the list is is really surging U.S. production. And I thought the conversation last week on crude quality is so important and is, is often overlooked. But these headlines push thinking and certainly on machine trading uh, in particular. So I think that's that's probably the number one event. The other one would be if the Saudis and Russians and OPEC, I guess, back more supplies, even, you know, and I, I think presumably it'd be within the quota agreement. So, for example, the Saudis could could come back with 500,000 barrels a day and still be below their their quota under the the new agreement. The Russians, it's really unclear where they are because we haven't had an update since March. But you could see a similar scenario towards last year when you know the Saudis had started increasing production in response to the reimposition of of U.S. sanctions. And of course, they got ahead of the curve in the fall, and that really tanked prices towards the end of last year. I think another scenario, however, and one that I've talked about in in notes at Hedgeye and a little bit in my intro, is the idea that the Russians are really not on board with extending the cuts, and certainly their companies are not. And so I think the June OPEC meeting is being set up because of Iran Number one, being a very acrimonious meeting in which there probably will be little agreement on anything. And this would require OPEC to agree to renew the cuts and generally their unanimous unanimous decisions. But I think you also have this idea that Russia thinks the cuts aren't necessary anymore. And, and I don't think that would be the end of sort of cooperation with Russia on market management, but on specific cuts, I think it, it could be potentially the end. And I think the end of OPEC plus and the Russian involvement, which the Saudis view is so critical, I think that would be a very bearish case for, for oil. And I think you could see a big impact there. So, And of course, if there were to be some kind of unplanned or emergency SPRO release, I would put those all in the category of of sort of bearish scenarios, but I do think in general the market is is tightening. We're heading into a very high summer demand season, and geopolitical risk is probably the highest it's been in years. So I think that all points to higher prices in the second half of this year. Tracy Shukart, what's your take on both the bull and bear cases as we wait for this price consolidation to reach its resolution? Well, um, on the bear case, obviously, all the geopolitical tensions that we've discussed. Also, in the near term, the IEA report came out today, and OECD stocks have fallen below their five-year average. We've got OPEC overcompliance. We've got a strong physical market in the prompt. We've got Brent and Oman Dubai crude firmly backward dated. 
We've got healthy China demand imports reaching a record high of 10.6 million barrels per day, which is about a million barrels per day YOY plus 1 million barrels per day YOY. We've got a little bit softer India demand, but it's still up 0.3% year over year. And we've seen a slight drop in North Sea production. Over the longer term, I think for the bull case, um, we could have rising shale cost pressures, logistical constraints, restriction on flaring, continued capital discipline could undermine production growth in the United States, and also uh, rapid base declines and slowing productivity could lead to slower growth in U.S. production. Those would be my additions to the what we've already talked about is the geopolitical tensions for the bull case. But for the bear case, so for the medium to longer term, um, you know, we talk about the global slowdown. We have global trade contracting for the first time since 2016. We have uh, global manufacturing slowing sharply. Asia in particular, we need to look at. Asian PMIs have slipped below 50 for the first time in more than two years. And the last time was during the Mini recession we had in 2016 that most of us missed if you blinked. China industrial production numbers this morning were terrible. We're down again 5.4, and this is down from 18% in 2010 to give you an idea how bad it is over there. We have South Korea, which is considered the leading indicator of the region. Their export manufacturing and construction are all way down. We have a stronger USD coupled with rising oil prices that puts pressures on emerging markets as they got drunk on cheap debt over the last 10 years and now are facing record dollar note maturities, which can in turn put a squeeze on demand growth. And all of this, again, affects global energy demand. In fact, the IEA this morning just revised down growth this year by 90,000 barrels per day to 1.3 million barrels per day. Short-term factors would be, Joe mentioned the SPR release, China trade negotiations completely fall apart, OPEC, NOPEC deal falls apart, higher than expected U.S. supply growth, producers let go of capital discipline, and once there are no takeaway constraints as these new pipelines are completed in the from the Permian to the Gulf Coast. So I think all in all, those would be my arguments for the bear side. And as you weigh those bull and bear arguments, where does that leave you, Tracy, in terms of your uh, sentiment at this point? So over the near term, I agree with Joe. You know, I'm, I'm leaning more towards the bull side going into summer. But over the medium to longer term, I'm more worried about these this global growth slowing um, and what that will do to overall energy demand globally. Tracy, I know you are the goddess of charts, and our listeners love seeing your charts. Any chance we can get you to send us a chart book that we can distribute to our listeners today? Yes, I have a chart book. Um, I know I went over some of that information a little bit quickly, so I do have a chart pack you can send out that kind of highlights some of these points that I went over. Listeners, you can find the download link for Tracy's chart book on our homepage at macrovoices.com in the description of today's podcast. Let's go ahead and move on to Chris Cook. What is your take, sir, on both bull and bear arguments for crude oil? Well, two-tier market, really. You've got the U.S. market, and for me, then you've got the rent market, which is the rest of the world. And I think, you know, to quote Yamani, you know, Stone Age didn't end for want of stones, and the Oil Age isn't ending for you know, want of oil. It's basically becoming too expensive for the, you know, the rest of the world, if you like, to afford. I think that's a, become an increasing issue now. You know, it's driving, I think, potentially driving a global recession. And we're seeing the evidence of that in, already in many places. It's, you know, the, I don't, other than the odd spike, you know, something goes heavily uh, violent in the Persian Gulf. Well, yep, we might well see a spike. But I think 75, I think, was as high as it was going to go, Brent. I see more scope for downside, actually, quite a bit of scope for downside. As I mentioned earlier, I have to do with uh, what China we're up to. I see uh, the scope for a fall. I think the Chinese will definitely back off. I think they are already backing off. They've got lots of buffer stocks if they need it. You know, plenty of reserves sitting there. They can they can afford to sit and wait and apply some pressure to the distressed sellers. And I think that's exactly what they're going to do. 
And so, you know, it will, we'll see during the next few months. I think there's a potential for a, you know, on the one hand, you've got a uh, potential slide. I think one of the most interesting developments, Eric, was the, you know, you, you post these, the evolution of the curve and, and the fact that even though the backwardation is increasing, the spot price remains, you know, remain where it is. And it just reminds me, I think to myself, is somebody actually holding it up there? Is what is happening actually a financial event that somebody's holding it up there? And that basically you've then got people just hedging and selling forward while they can. And that's why we got backwardation. And of course, backwardation leads to de-stocking. It's not the other way around. You know, de-stocking is a consequence of backwardation. And if there is a financial player in the market, as I'm long suspected there is, and Brent has never been more easily supported, as Tracy actually pointed out, that there's there's very little crude coming out the North Sea at the minute. So, you know, for me, the Brent tail is wagging the oil market dog here. And the question is, is has somebody got a hold of that tail? You know, that's the way I would say it. So I'm just chucking some provocation into the mix there, Eric. And with that, listeners, we need your help putting the word out that there is a new podcast in town and that we intend to become the definitive information source for energy traders, investors, and others interested in energy markets. You can subscribe to Energy Week and Macro Voices generally on iTunes or at macrovoices.com. You'll also gain access to our Thursday night podcast, which has a much more general macroeconomic focus. We're also looking for sponsors so that we can keep all of our Macro Voices content free to the listener. If your company is interested in sponsoring Energy Week, please contact me by emailing info at macrovoices.com. Before we close, I want to ask each of our panelists what they're going to be watching for in energy markets in the coming week. Chris Cook, let's start with you. What will you be watching for in the coming week, aside from, of course, listening to Energy Week next Wednesday night? I'm watching the curves. I, I, I you know, As you've probably gathered, I, I find it really interesting what's, what's going on there and the participation of the um, financial side, shall we say. But also, I'm a big China watcher right now. The deals that they've been striking, you know, these term deals between the, the state companies and the Saudis recently, at the same time that the Saudis seem to have backed off the US, I find that deeply significant. And, um, you know, also in the meantime, you've got the Chinese teapots. Well, they're a lot bigger than the word teapot actually makes makes you think, and they're they're gearing up, you know, for exports. And I think that there is scope for the Chinese to do something very interesting in the next few months. I think, as I say earlier, I think they're going to let the um, the Iranians twist in the wind for a while. That's the way they work. But you know, the financial markets moves at light speed, and the tanker market moves at tanker speed. You know, so it's going to take some time for this to pan out. And Tracy Shukart, what will you be watching in the coming week? Well, obviously, um, you know, I'm waiting to for our OPEX to be over um, because, you know, I think we're, we've sort of been pinned in this area partially due to that. So I want to see if do we have our typical rollout after that? Does the market come down? So I'll be, you know, watching the price action that way from a technical standpoint. Also, you know, I'll keep a very big eye on, you know, this sort of Saudi U.S. versus Russia Iran alliance and what is going to happen in that that region as it seems to be escalating slowly, but not with a lot of foundation, in my opinion. So um, that's obviously something I'm going to keep an eye on. Also, you know, anything having to do with China. I'm also going to be looking forward. To, I want to see, you know, what their imports are looking like for, for the month of May, because again, you know, buyer of last resort. I, I kind of want to see it has this, you know, big spike recently been in preparation of something. Did they gear up when they could buy as much cheap Iran oil as they could? And, you know, they've backed off a little bit now. So I think, you know, when we start seeing numbers for May, it would be really interesting kind of a gauge of what their buying habits, you know, going forward into the future. So those are the kinds of things that I'm, I'm looking at. And Joe McMonagall, what are you watching next week? Well, not surprisingly, I'm going to be watching uh, uh, Jetta and the the OPEC meeting on on Sunday, and of course, you know how it gets explained both on Sunday and the day or two after. So the spin 
because everyone kind of has their own spin after they leave uh, the, the meeting and they go back to their own media. So I think that we'll be watching that. And also, I, you know, as I said uh, earlier in the show, keep an eye on Venezuela. I think um, we could wake up one day and see you know, the U.S. taking uh, much more aggressive action. And then certainly the Guaido folks are agitating now for a much stronger U.S. response, whereas you know, maybe a month or two ago, they were really urging caution in terms of this whole military option thing. Now they're kind of the biggest cheerleaders, I think, for it. So that's another thing that I would, uh, I'm always watching, and I would suggest uh, the listeners keep an eye on. Macro Voices Energy Week will be released every Wednesday evening, folks. Next week's panel includes petroleum geologist Art Berman, author and consultant Anas Alhaji, and commercial broker Pat Hemsworth. But before we let this week's panel go, I'd like to ask each of you to please tell our listeners where they can follow your work and learn more about what you do, starting with Chris Cook. You can follow my commentary. The best place to follow my commentary is at my um, my Twitter handle is uh, C J E N S Cook C Jens Cook, and that's the best place to find uh, what I've got to say about the oil markets, energy markets, and very many other things as well. And of course, anybody who's anybody already knows Tracy Shukart's Twitter handle is Shy Girl. Tracy, <laughs> tell us more about where we can follow your work. That is where you can follow my work, um, but. In the coming week, we, I may have uh, something new to share. Ooh, sounds exciting. We'll be staying tuned for an update from Tracy. And Joe McMonagall at Hedgeye. You can reach me at uh, Hedgeye, the Hedgeye.com website. You can see um, we put excerpts of client notes there. And also uh, in more real time on Twitter, on my Twitter handle at Joe McMonagall. And that's a wrap for this week for Macro Voices Energy Week. I'm Eric Townsend. We'll see you all next week, everybody. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Please register your free account at macrovoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. 